Uh, so, did you see it? No, I don't suppose. Does anybody read the Telegraph? No, I don't, but I go on Twitter, and there are people on Twitter who read the Telegraph, so they tell me about it. But in the Telegraph this week, apparently, in the last day or so, um, Richard Dawkins has come to Hay on Wye to the book festival. You know the book festival's on at Hay on Wye at the moment? Stephen Fry is there, and everybody who's noisy is there. Um, so they're in the area, and... Uh, Dawkins was standing up, obviously, because he was promoting his new book, out of which he's going to make more millions, I expect. Uh, that's, that's the way it goes, isn't it? He uh, slags off Christianity and makes money out of it. That's his living, I think. Uh, but uh, the next money-spinning book, he's standing there talking about that. And, and somebody asked him a question, some clergyman of some description. And Dawkins came out with a statement that's got the religious puzzle, because he was speaking about being a secular sort of Christian, if you like. He likes it. He likes Christianity, he says. After all he's been saying for so long, that's quite, quite an interesting revelation for us. But uh, there it is, he's saying, yes, he quite likes it. In fact, you could call me a secular sort of Christian. And apparently he has been seen around Oxford sneaking into the backs of local churches around the city. Because he likes it. He likes the ceremony, he likes the quiet, the, you know, all the stuff. It meets his aesthetic, he might say spiritual need. But Christianity that's just for this age, I'm a secular Christian, a Christian for this age, that's not Christianity. If Christ is not raised from the dead, then is your faith in vain. You know, Paul, Paul addresses that one head on in 1 Corinthians 15. But it's interesting that Dawkins considers he has needs, and those needs can be met by some manifestation of Christianity at least. Isn't that interesting? Perhaps it's a bookseller, I don't know. But this is the truth out of this matter. In God's coming kingdom, needs are met. Needs that we have and needs that are really met in his coming kingdom. Does that make sense? In God's kingdom, needs are met. And yet up against God's incoming kingdom, the status quo's forces tend to object and in Jesus' culture and ours, the established religion is a pillar of the status quo. Religion objects. So, for example, not so long ago, there was a chapel of my acquaintance that was objecting to people of a certain sort coming into their place. Now, how does that fit? Religion objects, you see, to people's needs being met in Christ. Before I start to sound like a revolutionary Marxist, which I'm not, I'm going to, I'm going to try and show you what it is that I mean. And, and, and we're looking at Mark, chapter 2, 23 onwards. Let's clear the ground. There is a world of difference to be, tw to be found between following Jesus and following a religion. It is not as if they're on the same spectrum. They're on a different planet. Utterly different things. And at its starkest, it comes down to this. Did you see the poster this week? Ah, well, it was in the wrong places for you guys anyway, so that, that'll be it. It was on Tinternet. Uh, it goes onto the Facebook page, which you've all been liking and sharing, because that helps. Uh, okay, here's, here's how it goes. Religion sets you rules, and Jesus sets you free. Now, that is a sort of a simplification of the theology that's concerned. But what is Paul saying? Galatians 5, 1, it is for freedom that Christ has set you free. Right? This is what the Lord Jesus does. He sets people free. And we can, we can, we can formalise that theologically. We can say he sets free from the, the, the condemnation of sin. He sets free from the guilt of sin and so on and so on. Not the presence, not even the practice of sin, sadly, in our lives. Although he's working on that by his spirit. who's at work in us. You know, I could reference Romans 8 and 13 and following. Right? So, yeah, that, but there's the truth. He has begun this process of setting his people free, which will be consummated in glory. Right? But he's, he's begun it now, and it's here, and it's real. It should be real for us now. Religion sets you the rules. Do this, do that, do the next thing. If you don't, we look down our nose at you. And Jesus says, by my blood, you are forgiven. You are set free. Now, those are not two things that can be allied with one another. Those are two absolute opposite poles. And that's exactly what Jesus was saying in the passage before this when he talked about sewing a patch of new cloth onto an old garment. You will damage both. Putting new wine in old wineskins, you will waste both. They are not compatible. 
Religion is to do with the codification and institutionalization of rules, regulations, and ritual. The three R's. Ah, that was good. I'll do it again. I quite like the sound of that. Religion is to do with codifying, institutionalizing, putting them into structures, committees, the rules and the regulations and the ritual of religion. Right? But following the king in the kingdom of God is to do with repentance and restoration to relationship. Repentance and restoration to relationship. And those are polar opposites. One of them is Christianity, the other is not. And Jesus is absolutely clear, as he spelled out in Mark 2, 21 to 22 already, institutional religion and biblical Christianity are incompatible. Now, I'm saying that and you're looking at me and yeah, obvious, but no, it's not obvious. Because we say that, now we've got that intellectually, but then the way we go on and practice but we need to keep telling ourselves that thing. You know, it's like we understand grace, but the little inner Pharisee keeps cr cropping up again, and he keeps on putting rules on us, and keeps on condemning us. We are forgiven with the, the blood of Christ at the cross, right? And he keeps on popping back as a parrot comes and sits on your shoulder, isn't it? You know, the accuser of the brethren whispers in your ear, what a waste of time you are. One of these is Christianity, the other isn't, and we need to keep that clear. So as we approach this passage, what's happened in Mark so far is something like this. Jesus has appeared, and he's appeared preaching that the kingdom of God is at hand, so people should repent and renew their trust in the coming king. Yeah? And then he shows it, you should show that by, by following him, he calls people to follow him. So you show your repentance and your trust on the basis that the kingdom is coming by following Jesus. And part, at least, of that following Jesus involves becoming fishers of men. That is, rescuing them in this big net out of what's coming, out of the wrath of God, into the mercy and the grace of God in his kingdom. And the religious bore with that for a short while. They put up with it. But then there was that miracle at the beginning of chapter 2, you know, the one with the bloke on the bed and the roof and the hole, yeah? And Jesus showed there that he is the one who has authority on earth to forgive sins. I, the Son of Man, of Daniel 7, right, the one who shares the eternal throne with God in Daniel 7, comes and takes, sits down on the throne of God, right? This one, the Son of Man, has authority on earth to forgive sins, and he proves it while they're watching by saying to the guy, okay, then I'll prove it, get up and walk. He says, your sins are forgiven. Who can forgive sins but God alone? Um, the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. Watch, get up and walk. And he gets up and he walks. So now he's addressed this whole set of things that they're not going to cope with at all. And from that point on, there's opposition from the religious to Jesus. When the real Jesus comes into the open, when who he is and what he does is made evident, religion attacks. They are the opposition. Religion sets rules. Jesus sets free. And religion doesn't want that to be the case. Religion sets rules. Jesus sets free. And we're going to see it now in three episodes here in Mark's Gospel today as both the leaders of religion and the kingdom of God encounter real human need and do it simultaneously. Jesus encounters human need. He encounters a lack of food. He encounters a lack of livelihood. And then he encounters this oppression with sickness and demonization and whatnot, the effects of pagan religion on people in the third episode. Religion responds in one way, and Jesus and the kingdom of God make a completely different set of responses. And you see the difference. Okay, firstly, the objection to meeting human need, hunger in this case. Chapter 2, verses 23 to 27. Okay with the colors? They separate the sections of what's happening. So it makes clear what's happening. First of all, Jesus is going, setting the scene. Jesus is going through the grain fields on a Sabbath. His disciples begin to pick some heads of wheat as they made their way along. And they're just grinding them in their hands and eating. Now, the law allows that much work on the Sabbath. Yeah. What happens next? The Pharisees said to him, look, why are they doing what's against the law on the Sabbath? It's quite possible that what's happening is this. You're allowed to grind some grain and eat it on the Sabbath, but you're not allowed to carry it. 
as they were going along, you see. They were walking through the fields on the Sabbath. Do you see the point? Now, I can't tell you that is the case, but it looks like that's the position. Does that make sense of it? You're not allowed to carry a burden on the Sabbath. So, first two things are happening. They're going along doing that. The Pharisees come along and object, and he says to them, haven't you heard what David did when he was in need? That's the point. There's a need. He and his companions were hungry. He, he did what you're not supposed to do. He went into the... It wasn't on the Sabbath, but it was something that was against the Old Testament written down law rather than just their silly little rules they've made up. They did that. David did that. And, and there's the implication then. Here's David's greatest son. Here's the Messiah. I'm authorizing this. And then the fourth thing. He said to them and he taught them positively. The Sabbath was made for people, not people for the Sabbath. For this reason the Son of Man is Lord even of the Sabbath. Mark sets the scene, shows the context in which this objection takes place. There's that lovely picture of Jesus wandering through Galilee with his followers, wandering through a grain field after synagogue on the Sabbath day. You know, um, you know how you feel when you've done church and you're going home, yeah? How do you feel? How do you feel? Hungry, yeah? Why did church make you hungry? It, it happens like that, doesn't it? So here are these guys, they've been the Sabbath, you know, the Sabbath's been, and they've been the synagogue like good little lads and done their stuff, and, they just, and they're, they're ready for their lunch. They're hungry. And if you're walking home during the af early afternoon on a, a summer's day and you see some nice juicy blackberries on a bush in a hedge, you know, I think we're getting there, aren't we? You can see what's going on in this situation. And the Old Testament law allowed them to take a little from the field for their sustenance. So they did, but there's a problem. And we've outlined what it is, they're walking along. There's a problem. Jesus' encounter at the house with a hole in its roof had aroused the animosity of the religious. That's the real problem. And they're watching. They're watching for an opportunity. And these guys are controlled by law, not by grace, and that makes a man vindictive. Have you noticed that? If you're controlled by law, not grace, that makes a man vindictive. Because of that, they start looking to catch you. So, law, Sabbath, objection. Why are they doing what's against the law on the Sabbath? There's a, there's a particular section here of Mark's Gospel that's going on, and Mark began that section with um, a Sabbath story. Jesus, in that, in chapter 1, 21 to 28, Jesus was in the synagogue at Capernaum, and there was a guy there with an evil spirit, and he drove out the evil spirit, and they objected because he was doing it on the Sabbath. That's religion for you. But the stark contrast is... Uh, here is that actually the response of the Jewish leaders on that occasion they, they didn't kick up a fuss the first time round Jesus hasn't been making this point about sin and his ability to forgive it and uh, by this time he has and, and now they really, they really kick up and they object Jesus is not doing what's against the law his disciples are not doing what's against the law they are breaking the Pharisees interpretation extension of the Sabbath law it's the tradition of the elders that they are citing, putting human rules against what the followers of Jesus are doing, claiming that their own rules, their religious rules, are God's rules. And of course, Jesus will return to that sort of thing in Mark chapter 7, when he deals with these people and their traditions of the elders. For the meantime, he refers to this incident in the life of David. The need of food. And then he says... Okay, we dealt with that one. He says, look, you've got your anthropology wrong and you've got your Christology wrong. Well, not quite, but yes. He says to them, the Sabbath was made for people, not people for the Sabbath. You've misunderstood the doctrine of man. The Sabbath is something that's made for man, not man for the Sabbath. Man is at the pinnacle of God's creation. And Sabbath is made for his rest and for his benefit, and for his help. And the Sabbath is made so that his needs can be met with rest. It's not the other way around. It's not that your religious institution and your rules, man is made for them. You've got this the wrong way up. You've misunderstood your anthropology, what people are, and also you've messed up your Christology, because the son, the reason, for this reason, the Son of Man is Lord even of the Sabbath. 
He is the Son of Man. He is the one who shares the throne of God. And if he is the one who was present in creation as God at creation, then part of his creation, the Sabbath that's made to rest his creation, is under his authority too. And that for them would be a huge problem. Why? Because they make such a lot of the Sabbath. Why do the Jews make so much of the Sabbath? Because it's something that's easy to see if somebody's keeping it and therefore easy to police. And that's what they're interested in. Policing the rules. That's what motivates them. Policing the rules. Um, there was something on the BBC website earlier in the year, not, not so long ago, about um, an Eruv being set up in Greater Manchester. Have you come across this? Uh, even to this day, Orthodox Jews who try and keep these Sabbath rules still, um, they find it impossible. So, for example, there's, there's, in the article there's a, an example cited of somebody who's got a, a child who's ADHD. And he's got things that he has to help him not be distracted and not be you know, utterly disruptive in, in synagogues. Uh, and, and one of them is a sort of a pack with music that he listens to and it, it calms him and that's fine. He's not allowed to use that on the Sabbath to go to synagogue because it's carrying a burden. And he has worry toys as well that you know, help him. Yeah? He's not allowed to do that either because it's the Sabbath. Unless, further rules, unless you set up an Erov, so it's cost over £350,000 to set up a barrier, a boundary. They put a wire around, they've had planning permission from three separate authorities and whatever. They create an area where the Sabbath rules don't apply. And this is how religion works. That's not an anti-Semitic comment. It's an observation. It could be any other religion with its rules. But do you see the point? This is how religion works. Religion sets you rules. Jesus sets you free. Couldn't even push a pram. Couldn't even push a baby in a buggy. You know? Because it's the Sabbath. Wheelchairs, push chairs, zimmer frames... House keys, mustn't carry your house keys or your mobile phone because that's carrying a burden on the Sabbath. You can see the inhumanity, the unworkability of these things. Look, Sabbath was made for the Son of Man, not Son of Man, not, not, not Man for the Sabbath, and the Son of Man is Lord of the Sabbath. That's the point. It's easy to mistake the rules of your religion with his rules. And that's an easy thing and it's a thing we've got to watch. Okay, so there's the objection to meeting human need hunger and the way Jesus deals with it. The next objection, chapter 3, the beginning of, is the objection to, objection to meeting human need a livelihood. Because as Jesus goes, uh, goes along in, in, in uh, Mark 3, 1 to 6, what happens is he goes back to synagogue. Obviously there's an afternoon service, or maybe there's a Sunday school. You know the way it happens in most chapels, you have a morning service, you have a Sunday school in the afternoon and then you have your evening service at upper six. And you, I don't know, somehow Jesus goes back to synagogue again and there's a man there who has a withered hand. Well, it may not be on the same day. So. He goes back on another occasion maybe even. There's a man in the synagogue and the man in the synagogue has got a withered hand. Now we're living in a time, we're talking about a time where if you had a withered hand, your livelihood was at stake because work was manual. So this guy is sitting in, in church and he's, he's stuck for a livelihood. And they watch Jesus closely to see if he's going to heal that man on the Sabbath so they could accuse Jesus. We don't know if this is a set-up trap. We, we just don't. It could be, a well be, a set-up situation. What's he going to do? Well, the first thing to notice is that in spite of the problems with the established religion of Jesus' day, Jesus does not call down a plague on their prayer houses, vowing never to darken the doors again. Not this time. He goes to synagogue. <laughs> there are people in there who have been taken in by their spiritually drifting leaders. They are in need of the Son of Man's enlightenment, and he goes there. Now, he doesn't sort of join in with churches together or synagogues together in Galilee, Right? He's not saying, oh yeah, we're all the same. He's not saying that, precisely not saying that, but he does go along. Unless they sling him out. He will go into the darkest and most desperate places, and that can include synagogues. But as he goes along, the, the renegades are also in the house. We don't know if the disabled man was a plant. We don't know if this was a trap to catch Jesus out publicly. But if it is a trap, what does Jesus do? He marches straight into it with an agenda of his own which he makes sure that he pursues. He's not scared of that. 
he takes control. Don't fear the devil's traps if, this is the if, if you are in a position by entering those to break open the bars of those traps and liberate the lost from the trap. That's relevant to the week we've had, isn't it? Not to be part of it, but to break the trap. But as he goes in there, just look, just look at the malice of these religious leaders. They watch Jesus closely to see if he would heal on the Sabbath so they could accuse him. So often we go into places, don't we, and we're being watched closely. You find that? They want to be able to accuse him. They want him to do something that they consider sinful in order to try and polish him off. They are not conditioned by grace. You know, Paul writes, doesn't he, the people of this world, are, we, we were amongst them ourselves at one time, hated and hating one another. This is what characterizes graceless relationship. They're not out to save sinners. They're aliens to the purpose of God. So there's Jesus. There's this man with a livelihood depriving disability. There are these Pharisees, I guess, looking to use Jesus' compassion to cause his own downfall. What's he going to do? He said to the man who had the withered hand, stand up among all these people. That's okay, because his legs are fine. It's just his hand, isn't it? He stands him up, and he stands him up so that everybody can see what's going to happen. Everybody's going to see. I want your hands in full sight, young man. Stand up. And then he turned to the people who were picking on him and trying to catch him out, and he says, okay, here's a question. Is it lawful, your definition, is it lawful to do good on the Sabbath or evil, to save life or destroy it? The religious answer is absolutely clear. They can only say one thing. No, it is not. So they don't say it. They remain absolutely silent. Stand the guy up. Here's the question which reveals that you are intellectually without a case and you are actually without a cause. Jesus heals him. Intellectually, the case is destroyed. And then actually, they are confounded. Jesus looks at this religious situation where the rules are more important than the need. And after looking around at them in anger, justified, grieved by the hardness of their hearts, justified, he says to the man, stretch out your hand. What's the man got to do? This isn't the major point, but it's a relevant thing. What's the man going to do? <laughs> there's them and there's him, and what am I going to do? I could look a complete wally. But he stretches out his hand. And as he does so, Jesus puts him right. Jesus meets his need. Hunger, employment, disability. See, we can't stand there like Jesus and command stuff that afflicts folk to be gone. But we can stand there and ask him to do it. And the only question is whether we're afraid to do so. It did shock the last bloke who wanted to box off me a little bit, I think. But I worked very hard to be nice about it. I didn't pray about it. <laughs> well, why else are we here? See, Jesus is not in a potentially embarrassing situation here. He's not a potentially embarrassing situation. It is a desperately threatening and dangerous situation. He says, stretch your hand there. These people are powerful. They're gunning to get him. And the Son of Man mans up and does it. He says, stand up. He says, what's right here then? They've got no answer. He says, stretch your hand out. He stretched it out and it was restored. And that is fantastic. Can't you see that what has happened here is infinitely more significant than this guy's livelihood has been restored in his hands, his hands. You know, withered hands take physio to come back, you know what I mean? His hand is completely restored. That's fantastic. But so much more than that's going on. God's signs of mercy and restoration always show us more. They point to a truth. They're not tricks. They're truth testified to. And the truth is this, that the, the, the eternal 
The kingdom of God is coming in. It is time to repent. It's time to put your trust in Jesus and be done with that religion. Expressing that by following him, become a fisher of men, become a follower, and so on. That's being shown. But more than that, the character of God is being revealed. It's been shown to be not legalistic, but gracious. It's not about religion. And the world is an infinitely brighter place than their religion has led them to believe it's going to be. And it's a, it's a, eternity is now a prospect worth living for. Because this is the heart of God. Meeting need. Feeding hungry people. Restoring livelihood to people. With the dignity and the measure of prosperity that brings. Out of that miracle of mercy, the world of so many people gets brighter. Religion sets you rules. Jesus sets you free. Now, of course, he had to listen to Jesus, true. He had to trust Jesus to act and hold out his hand, regardless of his fear of the Pharisees. But when he did, his, his, his hand, his livelihood, his temporal, his eternal destiny, restored as he trusts Jesus. I love this story, it's obvious. And that is really what Christianity is all about. You've lifted me out of the slimy pit, says the psalmist, and you've put my feet on a rock, and you put a new song in my heart, a song of praise to my God. Now, if you'd been sat in that crowd there that day, how would you have responded to that? I mean, that is just, oh, come on, that's phenomenal, isn't it? Isn't that great? If you've been sat in that crowd, what will you do? What do you do when God does great and gracious stuff like that? So the Pharisees went out immediately and began plotting with the Herodians as to how they could assassinate him. Religion does not resort to God, you see. Religion resorts to mankind. Religion does not entrust itself to God. It sees its rituals and rules as a source of all answers. And that is the essence of unbelief. It doesn't resort to God. It resorts to its rules and its institution. Its ritual. What can we do about Jesus? He won't shut up. They can't make him shut up by outwitting him, that's for certain. They will therefore resort to plotting to assassinate him. And look at the allies they choose. Now, they've just been saying, this man, Jesus, is a friend of tax collectors and sinners. And who do they go to, to team up with, to do away with him? The Herodians. The immoral collaborators with the Roman, the evil Roman Empire. Whose lives, well, we know about from John the Baptist, don't we? Headless John. Lost people resort to Jesus. Religious people don't. Lost people flock to Jesus because he meets their deepest and their most profound needs in the most gracious of possible ways. So the first story is about the objection to meeting need hunger. The second is about the objection to meeting need livelihood. And then there's this response of people to God's kingdom meeting human needs. And that's chapter 3, verses 7 to 12. Mark's story has four elements. Again, there's Jesus' popularity amongst non-religious people. First of all, he made no secret of standing apart from the religious, showing them up as not part of God's purpose. He is the effect of standing apart from the religious and pursuing the proclamation and the priorities of the kingdom of God. People see something different and they flock to Jesus. It's the one in gold on the screen. Jesus went away with his disciples to the sea and a great multitude from Galilee followed him. They weren't coming for a beachside holiday. They were coming because they'd seen Jesus meet a need by his mercy and grace. And look where they've come from. They've come from Judea, Jerusalem. Yeah, I guess I understand that. But oh, oh, that's the religious heartland, you see. Judea, Jerusalem, that's where the religious are strong. Idumea, that's 
way out down bottom right hand side. That's, that's pagan land. Beyond the Jordan River, that is. Yeah, that's right. And they'd come from around Tyre and Sidon, at the opposite sort of corner of the world in people's view at that time. A great multitude came to him when they heard the things he'd done. Look, there's the geographical spread. This is a map of the entire ancient world, okay? And that stuff in the red circle down there, that big, huge chunk, is the area from which these people came to this Jesus that early in his ministry. Because the kingdom of God was evidently breaking in, and this was not religion that they knew about at all. It's a huge catchment area. They came from all those places. Why? They heard about the things he'd done. What had he done? He'd done the things that it was prophesied that the Messiah, God's appointed Saviour, would do when he came to bring in the kingdom of God. He did the things of God. That's what he'd done. And what's more, he backed up his statements that he was the one by being the one and doing what the one would do. He met the needs that existed because of sin in the world. See, there's lots of philanthropists. He wasn't a philanthropist, a doer of good to mankind. He was God in the flesh the doer of God to mankind. See the importance of that difference? He wasn't a doer of good, he was a doer of God. God had come. And that's very evident from what we're told next here. Because of the crowd, verse 9, chapter 3, because of the crowd he told his disciples to have a small boat ready for him so the crowd would not press toward him. For he healed many so that all who were afflicted with diseases pressed toward him in order to touch him. Jesus' big emphasis throughout this gospel, at least up until 831 and probably beyond, has been proclaiming the incoming kingdom of God. That's the big emphasis. That's what Jesus is for. From chapter 1, verse 15, you know, Jesus went out and he began to proclaim the kingdom of God is at hand, repent and believe the gospel. That is what he is, that is his function. That is what he's for. He does that and then he shows it by these signs that point to it and reinforce it, yeah? So why, when this vast, geographically and culturally diverse crowd gathers, why does he go and get into a boat? Well, okay, Mark gives us a handle on it. He does it so the crowd won't press towards him. But, but look, if what Mark meant was that he was trying to get away from the crowd, he'd have got into the boat and gone away from the crowd. That's not what it says. As on other occasions, he's engaged with sick people in the crowd and then he gets onto the boat and gets out on the water. Why? So he can address them and proclaim to them God's kingdom without being tangled up in them. You can't preach to people. You can't address a crowd that's there. <laughs> you can't. You need to be back a bit and then you can speak to the people on the shore. He had healed many. They were getting all over him. But there's so much more he needs to do for them than simply heal their sick bodies. His priority is to get them the good news of the gospel because that way they're going to live forever not just survive their current illness. And still he is releasing people and restoring and renewing relationship with God by the proclamation of the gospel. This isn't a religion that sets rules. This is initiating a relationship that sets you free. And that's what he needs to be able to preach. Free from what? From scary stuff. All of it the fruit of the fall. Read the list of it here. Sickness, unclean spirits, afflicted with diseases, healed of diseases, delivered of demons. Not setting rules, but setting free. Not a religion, but a restored relationship where not the rules rule, but it is the relationship with the king that rules. The relationship with the king that rules in our hearts. And even the demons know who he is, but the religious haven't a clue. And their passion is to conspire with pagans to kill him in pursuit of their religious objectives. In the kingdom of God it is not the rules that rule but the relationship that's restored with the king and the king rules. Religion sets you rules. Jesus sets you free. And religion is going to gun for you if you're a follower of Jesus. We need a different word for this. I don't know what it is. Jesus tribe? I don't know. <laughs> How do we express this? 
Oh, you go to church, you're religious. No, actually, I'm a member of a tribe. I don't, I don't know. How do, you, how do you differentiate in our culture? I don't know. But let's be clear on this. That religion that is self-reliant insistence on rules and ritual can take a lot of different forms. Somebody tried to tell me recently, good man, tried to tell me just, just this morning that the religion that I'm talking about is bad religion and it's the fruit of liberalism. Yeah, and I have to say, yeah, it's also the fruit of reformed dogmatics. It's also the fruit of charismatic excess where the rituals take the place of the relationship. It can come in all sorts of forms. Do you see what I mean? It's not to knock anybody or any position or put myself in any camp. If you don't know which camps I'm in by now, you don't know much. <laughs> but, you know, um, it is to say that religion can take so many different forms and push the relationship out. But we need to differentiate that. It is religions, if you like, over against turning away from sinful self-reliance to live trusting in Jesus. That's what we're talking about. And we have to stand away from that to get clarity on the gospel of God. And we definitely need to do that in Wales. And Jesus has to do it in first century Palestine. So how do we do that? I've actually, you know, I've had the thought perhaps we could produce some sweatshirts. And we could print, you know. Religion sets you rules and Jesus sets you free, but I, I don't wear a sweatshirt terribly well. So I was chatting with a guy at, at, at the Burger Van yesterday morning, and he's not a churchgoer. And I'd, I'd sort of pointed up to him the problem that, that I have with differentiating from religion, which he is repelled by, this restoration of relationship with Jesus Christ, which he's not repelled by at all to my great surprise, some delectation and delight. Oh, that's interesting. Um, so, how do we do that? And he said to me, all you can do, Simon, is live the life you live. And people will know the difference. Isn't that interesting? Is it, it is as guys like the guy with the withered hand, like the guys whose bellies are now sorted, <laughs> because they've had the grain. It is as the people of God live in the grace of God, in this restored, gracious relationship, that religion is finished and life is found in Christ. 